Professor Liam O'Mahony. Professor Liam O'Mahony is um, a professor of immunology at the Department of Medicine and Microbiology at APC Microbiome Ireland, the National University of Ireland, Cork. He's also currently a board member of the EAICI, and in particular, he has an interest in investigating the basic mechanisms by which microbes influence immune regulatory networks within the gut, skin, and lungs. Certainly looking at your Twitter yesterday, I could see some interesting aspects on these in the gut and digestive systems of children. And I also seem to think that you have a passion for dogs from looking at your Twitter, but I may be wrong. But much more interestingly, at the moment, he's coming to talk about um, immune effect and its effect in terms of the long-term symptoms of, of COVID. And I really look forward to in hearing about this because it's, it's something that we're going to be dealing with for a long time to come. So thank you for coming to talk to us. The button, I haven't touched it, but that button there is how you move your slides on. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. It's amazing what you find out on Twitter. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Zulu, our dog, has appeared on many uh, events uh, online. So yeah, everyone knows her. Um, but again, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the uh, invitation to come here today. And also thank you for the weather, so you're giving me an authentic, windy West experience. <laughs> um, the data that I'd like to talk about today, if I can go off this, it's actually very, very new, so it's even days old, some of this data. So I'd be really keen to hear your feedback and to hear your questions at the end, because we're still trying to figure out a lot of this data. As I said, it's really, really new. But I do have to start with just reminding you that the immune system, even though you're all aware it protects against infection, is not the only thing that the immune system does. It does a lot of other things. So it repairs damaged tissue. It's very important for your metabolism. It regulates your metabolism. And for us as researchers, the area we really look at is the immune system is really a communications uh, uh, network. And it manages the communication with things that happen outside the body and things that happen inside the body. And that's really a part that we're really focused on, is trying to understand how that communication works. But to do that, the immune system is quite unique. It's present in every organ of the body. Uh, it has very extensive sensory capabilities. And again, that's all part of this communication role that it has. And it has a huge array of molecules that it uses for effector and communication functions. And I know that's why everyone loves immunology, because there's so many hundreds of different molecules that we, we have to look at. And I think really uniquely about the immune system, it learns, it adapts, and it remembers. That's the basis of vaccination, but also many other aspects it has to learn, adapt, and remember. So in the lab, when we look at it, the immune system, there's many different cell types, there's, and they can be grouped into the innate or the adaptive immune system. But when we're doing translational research and we're looking in patients, you have to remember that all of these cells work together. They work together in concert. And the, the effect you see at the end is the result of all of these cells and, they, and their communication with each other. And I guess what's really important for us is who's the conductor of this system. And I do want to just mention that more and more we're realizing the conductor is actually the microbiome. These are the microbes that live in us and on us. And just to give you a few facts about the microbiome, so half of the cells in, your human, in the human body are not human at all, they're bacterial. These bacterial species, about 500 different species you can find in any person at any one time. If you take their genomes and you add up the genes, you get about 2 million genes. Now contrast that to the human genome of 20,000 genes, that means genetically speaking we're 99% bacterial. So it's really important that we understand, again, that communication with bacteria, because most of the time these are not infectious. This is a really homeostatic communication that's ongoing. These bacteria are very metabolically active. They secrete thousands of different metabolites. More and more we're finding that metabolites we thought were uniquely human are not human at all, actually. And many of these metabolites are contributed to our metabolome by bacteria. And also, and, and I might just mention, because this will be important later, I think, for the discussion, many of these metabolites depend on what you eat. So what you eat is what the bacteria in your gut eats, and the types of metabolites that they make um, can be very dependent on the types of foods that you eat. And as an immunologist, I'm really interested, and this will be the core of what we'll talk about today, of how these metabolites, primarily from the bacteria, can regulate the immune system. So this view of the immune system you know, protecting us, human, from everything that comes from outside is wrong. 
we're full of bacteria that are not us, and we don't have these aggressive immune responses in our mucosal surfaces. So there's another layer of immunity there that's a regulatory response. And this controls the immune system from reacting to things it shouldn't, like it does when someone reacts to an allergen. And also, it prevents it from overreacting when you get a, a challenge like SARS-CoV-2. And we feel this regulatory system is really key in preventing a lot of the severe outcomes to SARS-CoV-2, but also perhaps some of the post sequelae of COVID-19. And so I've kind of said this, so the immune education, and it starts the minute you're born, and the first couple of years of life is the really critical part, but it, it's always learning, uh, and it's the microbes and the microbe-derived metabolites that are really important. So as I said, you know, it, we look, when we do translational research, we look really in a broad way at many different cell types, at many different molecules. And just to uh, briefly introduce the molecules that I'll talk about today, so we looked at 54 different cytokines, and these are cytokines when the cells become infected, they're associated with activation of the innate immune system. Also, how the lymphocytes become polarized, we looked at many of those. The cells when to have to get to a site that's inflamed, and there's very specific molecules that do that, so we've looked at all of those. And of course, we've looked at the systemic response, like the acute phase response, and we've looked at a whole range of different vascular remodeling and uh, angiogenic molecules. And this is a, a, a broad summary of you know, everything that we found. We looked at just over 200 people, so 29 controls and um, 140 hospitalized COVID patients. So this is in the acute phase. And these were samples that were taken uh, immediately after hospitalization. So it's within the first 24 hours. And within the COVID group, there was uh, 42 were mild, moderate disease. Remember, these are still hospitalized. So they're sick enough to be hospitalized. So it's not mild, moderate from the community perspective, but it's mild, moderate from a hospitalized uh, cohort. And then within the severe cohort, 89 survived and 41 had a fatal outcome. So this gave us the opportunity to also look at what were the immune mediators that were different in those who ultimately had a fatal outcome versus those who survived, even though they all had uh, required ventilation. So the way that we represent this data on the left is a heat map. So anything in red was increased. And as you go along, and I, I, hopefully this pointer comes out, it does. So this is all the COVID patients. So 36 of these mediators were increased upon hospitalization. In the severe versus mild moderate, there was most of them were also increased. But if you look at the severe with fatal outcome and severe survivors, there was eight cytokines, seven that were elevated and one that was significantly different. So this is at the point of hospitalization. And if you look at the PCA plot on the right, this is grouping people together in a multi-dimensional space. But you can see the groupings of you know, people depending on their outcome these cytokine levels, so the activation level of the immune system, was really different right at the point uh, of hospitalization. And I'm just going to give you a few examples. So CRP, you all know, of course, and it's you know, very, very elevated in all the COVID patients. And it is elevated in the mild moderate, and it is you know, further elevated in those uh, with severe disease. But there's no difference between those who survived or who had a fatal outcome. So CRP is really good, but it doesn't give you that granularity of understanding or predicting who might have a fatal outcome or not. But some of the cytokines that do, so TSLP is thymic stroma lymphopoietin. It's in the alarming class of cytokines. So this is within epithelial cells. When they become damaged, they release this. It puts an alarm to the immune system. So this is coming from epithelial cells, we presume, perhaps from the lung, but it can also be from the gut. And so these levels are elevated in those with a fatal outcome significantly more than, and this is a log scale, I should say, as well. And the other one that was really interesting for us was IL-15. So IL-15 is important for natural killer cells. They're called natural killer cells because they kill virally infected cells. So this is really another indication of the epithelial cells are super, super activated. They're being killed, and the immune system directed to your epithelial cells is really hyperactivated as well. Um, we were really interested in the gut barrier uh, as part, this, I should have said this work was all funded by Science Foundation Ireland as part of its emergency response uh, funding call. We, and one of the things we really were interested in looking at was is there a failure in gut barrier in people, again, with the most severe outcomes. And there's a few ways we can look at that. Citrulline is released by small intestinal epithelial cells. If those levels decrease, it's an indicator of a loss of function of the small, of the small bowel. 
Uh, and that does go down, particularly in the severe patients, but there's no difference between those who survive or who don't. And we've also just recently, in the last few days, finished quantifying bacterial DNA in peripheral blood. So this isn't saying there's live bacteria there, but it's saying there's more material coming from the gut, uh, or perhaps the lung as well, because there's bacteria in the lung. And what you can see here is in those with severe disease, and in particularly those who had a fatal outcome, nearly half of them had elevated levels of bacterial DNA in the blood. So that may also be a good indicator for there's a big problem happening in the gut of patients with SARS-CoV-2. So we look at 1,200 different metabolites. These are both microbial and uh, human-derived metabolites. And the heat map on the left, so I, I should say that each person is shown here is a column, and the rows are uh, each metabolite. But it, you can really appreciate with the heat map here, you know, you have a lot in the healthy controls that are less, and as soon as you get sick with SARS-CoV-2, all of these become elevated. And hundreds of them change in the course of during acute disease. And again, these were samples taken uh, within, usually within 24 hours of hospitalization. So a, a huge reprogramming of the metabolism is ongoing uh, in people. And there's about 140 metabolites that distinguish those with a fatal outcome versus those who had severe disease and survived. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but this will be important for the long COVID part. Tryptophan is a really important amino acid, and we do find that tryptophan levels decrease in those with severe disease. And tryptophan is used to generate a whole range of different immune mediators, but also it's important uh, for cell signaling. And one of the things that, ser or that tryptophan is really important for is the manufacture of serotonin. And what we see is uh, concomitant with the decrease in serum tryptophan, we also see a switch away from serotonin production in acutely ill patients. And it switches to another uh, pathway, which is the kynurenin pathway, resulting in uh, quinolinic acid being elevated. And that's actually neurotoxic. So what you're seeing here is a switch away from neuroprotective uh, compounds towards a neurotoxic compound. And finally, we also looked at the microbiome in these hospitalized patients. And what we could see was actually if we just took a step back, and this analysis was done by Professor O'Toole's group, if we took a step back and looked at the microbiome composition in these patients, we saw two groupings. And when you looked at what was in those two groupings, there was one grouping that was characterized by high levels of what we call pathobionts. So these are primarily bacteria that are in many of us, but they don't really cause a problem unless there's something else goes wrong in the system. So they're kind of opportunistic problem makers. And we found one group of people had a high level of these, and one group of people had high levels of what we would call protective bacteria that we know secrete a whole range of metabolites that help the immune system to regulate itself. And amazingly, what we found was those who had the high pathobiont levels were the ones who had a fatal outcome. So it really separated with the clinical outcomes. And we were able to show this using, these are statistical techniques that are way above <laughs> my understanding, uh, but Tarini Ghosh uh, did this analysis. And basically what this shows us, the bottom line, is that all of these features I talked about, the elevated immune markers, the change in metabolism, and this pre-existing difference in microbiome, all grouped together into what we call a high-risk configuration. And that's high risk of a fatal outcome. So just to summarize uh, from the acute part, so we have a low-risk microbiome, and we feel this is pre-existing because the features we see uh, take a long time to change, we know from other microbiome studies. And this is associated with lots of regulatory and effector molecules. Uh, this leads to an immune system that's well able to deal with something like SARS-CoV-2, clears the virus quickly, and you protect the host from hyperinflammatory responses. But in contrast, you have people with a high-risk microbiome. Uh, you don't get enough of these regulatory molecules, and actually you get too much pro-inflammatory molecules. You have a change in the immune system, and then when it sees something like SARS-CoV-2, you get delayed viral clearance, and you get these hyper-inflammatory responses that go on and cause damage. And so this is important because we, we're using this data, of course, can we identify people at high risk? So this will come back into the routine lab, we hope, some of these um, markers. And then can we modify risk? So I mentioned diet is important for which uh, molecules that the microbiome makes, and we know some of these are different in these patients. So can we make lifestyle or you know, preventative uh, recommendations? And then the long-term consequences, what happens in those uh, with these markers in those with post-acute uh, sequelae of COVID. 
So if you remember, I called out TSLP and IL-15 as two cytokines that were really interesting in those severely ill patients with a fatal outcome. So with Dr. Karina Sadler at the CUH, uh, the consultant ID uh, uh, person there, in her post-COVID clinic, she has been taking serum samples. So in 21 people at a few time points, we've been able to look at some of these markers. And actually, it's really interesting, TSLP and IL-15 are still elevated in patients with long COVID. The other markers like you know, the TH1 immune response, the, the acute phase response, the CRPs, they're all back down to normal. But when you look at a bit more detail, there is still immune activation ongoing in these patients. And of course, they have the whole spectrum of symptoms. And this group is too small to try and pull apart. Is it you know, people with fatigue or people with you know, a, a brain fog? You know, do some of these mark some of these clinical phenotypes better? We don't know that yet. And just in summary, what we can see from an immune system point of view is we see an elevated TH2 response, which includes the TSLP, but also other markers. We also see an elevated TH17 response. This is the immune response that deals with bacterial infections, typically. So it's, it's, it, it's interesting to see some of those molecules are still up. Uh, the innate immune system activation, so the IL-15 and, and some of the others, is also still elevated. And we also see a lot of the vascular remodeling and new angiogenics, new blood vessel formation. That's still going on as well. Not at the same level as during acute disease, but it's still, it's, there's still some activation in the system. We also looked at the gut barrier. So in the acute phase, if you remember, I was showing that there's a failure in gut barrier. This doesn't seem to be the case in long COVID. So the barrier seems to have healed. Uh, so that's not part of the story. But when we, again, we, and this is literally just a few days old, this data, but we've done the full metabolomics on these people now as well, so the 1,200 metabolites. And what's really interesting is uh, people with long COVID, they separate really nicely from the healthy control group. And even if we separate out the patients that we sample from uh, three to six months or greater than six months, they still overlap with each other. So it means this is a very stable change in these patients that continues for a long time. And I mentioned about the tryptophan system specifically. So tryptophan levels are still lower in patient, these patients at least. Serotonin levels are still lower. And it's really driven by, there's a subgroup of patients that you can see here have really little or no detectable serotonin. And this is, I think, could be clinically uh, meaningful. And again, there's still upregulation of the alternative pathway, the kynurin quinolinic acid pathway. And quinolinic acid is known to bind through NDMA receptors in the brain. Uh, it can cause cell death of brain cells. So it's, this is not a nice compound. So again, you see this switch, which I think we need to explore further. So what I can summarize from all of this, I hope, is that I hope I've given you the impression that actually our physiology is very much shaped by non-human associated factors. And it's by our exposures, our lifestyles, our microbes that are part of us. We shouldn't consider them not part of us. And the immune response to microbes is not simply a form of defense. It's actually a very communicative and helpful relationship for the, the body as a whole. And it's the functional capacity and the metabolic outputs that are really important there that we're only really scratching the surface of right now. We really, that's what we're doing research on in Cork is to try and get deeper uh, with that understanding. And it's this molecular communication network, and we're calling ourselves a multicellular meta-community. So the meta-community is all of the cells that we're in. It's not just the human cells. And I think from the long COVID point of view, which I think is the one you're really interested in today, I mean, we really see an immune and metabolic consequences and this remodeling of the immune and metabolic system that is long-lasting after the acute phase of the disease. Um, the next steps, this is a small study still, so the next steps will be to build this out into a bigger study. On Monday, we just submitted a grant application to Science Foundation Ireland to really bring this out to many hundreds of patients and all of these kind of things that I've just talked about to really do all the omics you can imagine and really throw the kitchen sink at this and see can we figure out what is different and which symptoms some of these differences might be important for. And it, also from a diagnostic point of view, the, the feedback I have from the long COVID patient groups is they would love to have a diagnostic assay that you can come in and anybody can test you for if you have long COVID or not. So some of these findings I think will be really key. And we've already been talking with the routine hospital lab and CUH to see if we can get some of these up and running. 
There's problems with standardization and with all these other things, but we have to make a start, I think. And I just wanted to point out, we, ha we have this uh, online survey for patients with long COVID. We have hundreds of people in Cork. I would love some people from this region to also take part. If you go onto the APC uh, website, you'll find it, uh, and the uh, link is at the bottom. And finally, there's a load of people who have been involved in these studies, people in UCC, the ID team in CUH has been wonderful, uh, but also many international collaborators. So a lot of our patient samples are coming from St. Gallen, from Geneva, from Ticino. So we're getting samples for, from everywhere. Um, and also people helping out with the analysis, like at the Karolinska. So thank you for your attention, and I'd be delighted to take questions if we have time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that talk. It was fascinating, not just the long COVID bit, but actually right at the beginning, the changes that you see in your body's immune response and, and all that's entails there. Um, I just wondered, it, you talk about the initial change and the long-term change in relation to COVID. Is that mirrored in any of the other viruses that we see in influenza or the long-term sequelae that we see of some viral, viral, viral fatigue it's syndrome? It's not well studied. I mean, this is... I, you know, it's been a terrible time the last two years, but the opportunity and the funding is now there to look at these post-viral infection periods of time. Uh, influenza, I did find one study that uh, in those with really serious influenza infections, they can have this disturbance in the tryptophan metabolism part as well. Mm -hmm. But this really broad way that we're looking at it with all the omics, it, people really haven't done this before. Mm -hmm. But like this study was a quarter of a million euros, you know, it's uh, the money we looked on Monday from SFI is a million euros. That's the level of funding that needs to go into doing something like this. So I hope the enthusiasm is there now to really look at this because I think, you know, long COVID is real and it will be here with us, unfortunately, for a long time. So we really need to focus on yeah. it. And I think the findings, though, to your, answer your question, will be of benefit to those with other post-viral infection sequelae, like the MECSF community also, I'm sure, will benefit from some of these findings. Yeah. No, I think that's, it's interesting, and the amount of money compared to perhaps the effect of your findings mm -hmm. uh, seems proportionate. Yeah. So hopefully others Thank agree. <laughs> I hope they agree. <laughs> Online, we do have a question. Um, will elevated levels of specific inflammatory markers predict possible long-term outcomes of COVID? That's a great question, and that's, we don't know. Um, so... We are, so that uh, acute group uh, that I, we are following up with them, um, and they're now like a year out. Mm -hmm. um, so we hope to be able to answer that soon, but we don't know yet. Okay. I would imagine that, yes, you would have some predictive power in some of these mediators, mm -hmm. but we just don't know which ones yet. Okay, so more to come on that one. Yes, definitely. Uh, uh, go on, and Jer. So, so just repeat that for the, for the audience, sorry, online. Uh, Jared's psychiatrist, and she was saying how interesting this was in terms of how people with MA, ME had previously responded to serotonin and other medications that have received through psych, psych, in their psychiatric treatment. And has there been any study to look at the MD, NMDA and serotonin levels and the psychiatric symptoms of COVID? Yeah, it's, this is exactly what we've been talking with people uh, about you know, over the last week or two even. Um, because this is literally, you know, straight off of the, out of the lab within a few, uh, the last few weeks. But there are two studies that have been published showing that uh, SSRI, there's been two clinical trials showing that SSRIs can help with some patients during the acute phase. And I wonder, does that, you know, help with the serotonin system compensate a little bit for these decreases in serotonin that we're seeing as a possible mechanism? Um, I'm really being careful about recommending any intervention until we have the data because I don't want this to be another yeah you know, I'm even afraid to use some of the, the words <laughs> but yeah so it's definitely an area I'm sure my, my gut feeling is that this will be really important yes exactly 
exactly. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jer was just observing that when we see patients who've had COVID, it's important to think more than just about the isolation and the effects of, of our environment and, and maybe psychiatric um, conditions, but also to think about what are the effects of the COVID and could this be something we need to contemplate? Um, any more questions from the floor? We have room for one more and we have two hands up. Oh, um, we'll go for <laughs> two then. Um, Rochelle? So the question that Rochelle is asking is, for people who are asymptomatic, do they get the same sort of response and therefore potential long COVID symptoms? Uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, because you know, even if you're not symptomatic, your immune system is still working out really hard to clear the virus and, and get rid of the virus. And it's one part of it is working well because you're not feeling sick, but it's still, biologically, you're still responding quite significantly. So yeah, you can still have, or this can still be part of the long COVID story for someone who is very mild or even asymptomatic. Thank you. Did you, but my, my misunderstanding then, on your slides with people who were less severely affected, were they less likely to get long COVID or were they, had the, the same risk? So actually, we don't have data on that okay. because we're primarily looking at the hospitalized yeah. cohorts because they're the ones we have access okay, to. Yeah. Um, but the literature says that actually mild moderate disease is, seems to be associated with even more of a risk for getting long COVID. Yeah. At least the, the forms like the fatigue, the brain fog, the, the lung damage associated with, with long COVID is different. They're the more severe acute yeah. illnesses because um, it's a physical you know, impact. Mm. But the, yeah, the other uh, um, uh, outputs are, are, seem to be more likely in the mild moderate, and there seems to be more likely younger female uh, as well is the bigger risk, which is different to the acute, which is older male. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So there's yeah. a lot to follow here that could be interesting. And, and finally, we're going to push the time zone. What would you like to ask? Yeah, so they don't sorry exist. For the, oh, sorry for the thing. I'm really sorry we have to keep doing this. It's just you can't hear this. If you've ever listened to a conference online, it's frustrating not hearing the question. How soon are we to bringing these recommendations into clinical practice, such as blood tests for the IL-15? So they don't exist yet. Um, so, uh, but we, I literally had a call with the head of the biochemistry lab in CUH last week to start to that process. But it's really difficult to know how long it will take, of course. Because you know, there's even nobody there who knows how to do this. It's only in a research lab setting that we've been doing this. So I hope quickly, but how it's quickly weeks or months, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you very much.